Hello folks, welcome to the Bizzle's deconstruction of Star Realms. I get a lot in on this video, which I've mostly recorded the entire thing uh, of uh, already. So I will just say a quick table of contents on this great, inexpensive, easy to learn, addictive, endlessly replayable deck building game. First 30 minutes or so, I do a breakdown of the, the rules, uh, the strategy, the different factions, uh, what the symbols mean, uh, but mostly, you know, starting to build some basic uh, strategy because there aren't that many rules to the game. That's part of what's great about it. Easy to learn, hard to master kind of situation. Uh, says the guy with 1,700 games of online Star Realms under his belt from the last few years. Um, I do love it that much. It's one of my favorite games. And like the Resistance, for $15, you get a ton of game in here. Um, you know, this one is for two to four players. Mostly, you want to play two players. It's like a dueling game. Um, but it, 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 like I said with the Resistance, for both the cost, but the value, and the replayability, and just the, the greatness uh, of it, and, you know, the, the perennial interest that, that it will should uh, drive you um, uh, with, with the game. If you're going to have one, like, party social deduction game, definitely the resistance. Again, in terms of size, price, accessibility. If you're going to have one deck-building game, I would say Star Realms or Hero Realms, uh, which is the fantasy version of this, which is mostly the same but somewhat different. I will talk about that in the outro. And then after that initial half hour or so, where I play a couple hands, show you what the trade row's like, what you can buy, what you're trying to buy, why you care about what, what you're trying to buy, and so forth. And then I uh, do about a 10-15 minute uh, talk about accessories for the game, expansion, should you get them, do you need them, what do they do. Spoiler alert, you really don't need anything more than this 15 cards for the most part. There's a couple small expansions that might make it a little bit more re replayable and fun if you, you turn out to be a big fan. It's certainly not necessary. And with the app being free for the core set, which is this, you can play online as well and practice your skills against other players um, who are kind of ranked similarly to you or against AI, which is very, very good. Beating the hard AI on, on Star Realms is, is extremely difficult and it can't cheat unlike some more complicated games. Uh, but that's another podcast about AI on uh, b board game um, uh, uh, translations on, on computer, tablet, and phone. But this one is excellent and available on all of those things. Um, and then I talk a little bit more about deck building and similar things like Ascension, which was the precursor to this and have some of the same designers and so forth. And then a, and a short outro, a, outro after that. So I get a lot in on this small game. Um, and so I, I hope uh, it, it is worthwhile and interesting for you. Um, it certainly is for me. I love deck building games and I love card games and I especially love the genre of small games. And even Pandemic, uh, which retails for 40 but you can definitely get for 20 in the Game of Thrones card game with the core set, which normally is 40 bucks, but it's on Amazon for like $17 right now. All the games I'm showing you, hopefully, I feel are both accessible and very affordable. Now some of them, like Lord of the, uh, Lord of the Rings, like Game of Thrones, you have to invest more time and mental energy in, but it's still accessible, but it's great value for the money. Star Realms is like the Resistance. This one's for the people. Enjoy the Bizzlecast vidcast here of the Bizzles board games as I deconstruct Star Realms. All right, y'all, welcome to the table. In this first part, I'm gonna very quickly show you how the game is played. Um, and in fact, there's not a long way of showing you because it's just not that hard. Uh, and that's one of the many brilliant things of this relatively small little game. Comes in this. You should immediately replace that box with a real box to protect your cards. I don't normally sleeve my cards unless it's, you know, a game that I'm playing a ton um, or is really expensive. And in case you don't believe me, that the rules will be short. This is literally the entire manual, and most of it's clarification, telling you about the factions, the four factions, and so forth. Now, I already recorded the second part um, of this. Well, I guess the intro is the first part. This is the second part. So the final part of this is uh, me talking about uh, available expansions. Um, it talks about accessories you can buy. How many cards do you need? How many cards do you want? How many cards can you afford? Um, <laughs> spoiler alert, <coughs> you don't need more than the core set here. Uh, and it's very cheap indeed. Um, and I also talk a little bit about the history of deck building 
in Star Realms' role um, uh, in that relatively modern history of the deck building genre. Um, but I, I didn't realize that that part was going to go after this part. So uh, it might sound a little anachronistic at parts, but you'll get all the information. I'm talking about the great iPad, iPhone um, app as well, um, and uh, a lot of little nuggets like that. But here we are going to get into the game <coughs> with my friend Sting from Lord of the Rings. No blue glow. Keep your fingers crossed. So here we go. Here's the starting hand. So here's player, we'll call this player one, player two, the, the same amount of cards. I just splayed it here so you can see, even though you can't really see even with the splay. So starting hand, is, and this is a hallmark of deck building. Everyone starts with the same crappy starting hands. That's the whole point, is you're building your hand is the game. So in that hand, you have two Vipers, which do one damage, which when you consider they have 50 uh, health uh, is not very much. And you have eight one cast scouts. And that's it. And both players have that. So the way the game starts is technically, if you go first, you can only use three cards. Uh, so you actually want to go second because then you can use the full five cards. So normally it's five cards, Paul. But on the first turn, you're going to draw. Let's just pretend it's five cards on the first turn. Let's see what we got. Okay, so we got the two Vipers uh, for two attack. It's not ideal for your first turn. You really want money um, and three scouts equal to $3. So that brings us to the trade row. So the trade row always looks the same. You got your stack of cards here. The discard pile will be over here. You have five cards pulled out. The ones which are uh, uh, vertical um, portrait uh, layout are ships, which is probably two-thirds of the cards, and the other one-third, the ones that are sideways at the moment, and I'll talk about uh, the sort of the difficulty of them being sideways, but bases are very easy to identify because they are in landscape. Um, and in order to fit it up here, I turned them that way, but realistically, if you have a big enough table, turn the bases over, and you'll know you have five. Well, what's that sixth, you say? Well, this sixth is actually a, pile, a small pile of what they call explorers, which are available for two gold. And the reason that you have explorers for two gold, other than to keep leveling up slowly from your crappy one gold cards, is sometimes you literally can't afford cards in the trade row that cost more than, you know, four gold. And so you invest two gold and two gold, and you say, well, why am I paying two gold for two gold? Well, because you only get five cards per turn. So when you play all the cards, which, you know, you start with 10, so you only have two hands, and now you're already shuffling the deck. When you do that shuffle, even that first time, you want to have as many better cards as possible because right now you don't have, even with a with five, you know, uh, scouts, that's five bucks. So you are, are limited by the game throughout the game, starting at the beginning. You cannot buy, just using scouts, anything more than five, uh, five dollars. Whereas explorers, if you have five explorers, that's ten dollars, and no ship costs more than nine. And I don't. And then most of the sets, eight is the highest. So you're you're investing in future card draws in which you have explorers in your hand instead of scouts, giving you more money to buy. Okay, so what can money buy? We know it cannot buy love. Um, well, we hope it cannot buy love. So what what do we have in the trade row here? Okay, so now it's time to talk about. Uh, the types of cards in the game. Um, and there's only two and a half. And the reason I say that is because there's two kinds of bases, but they're still bases. And the vast majority of the cards are ships. So in this game, there are four um, colors, <laughs> four suits, uh, and they are called factions. Doesn't really matter, the ship names are stock. The ship designs at first are stock, but especially with each new uh, expansion to the game, they're you know they're they're kind of uh, <laughs> uh, enticing in, in in sort of their originality. I mean, they rip off like the Death Star and like tons of. I mean, there's you know that looks like a, a Starfleet shuttle, and indeed this is the so the blue is the Trade Federation, the yellow is the Star Empire. Uh, the red is called the machine cult. It's un unclear whether they're totally AI. That's how I imagine them. And then you have the you know flying space creatures um, uh, called the blobs or the blob um, as the green and fourth faction. But I really like the art style over time. I certainly prefer it to the very, very, very 
I think, boring, uh, unappealing Hero Realms fantasy art. I, I got Hero Realms just because I love Star Realms, and Hero Realms does have some advantages, as I've said, specifically th that the, there are fewer cards that do a lot of things, so all the complexity and depth is not nearly as good as Star Realms. It's a little bit easier to get started with people, and, you know, all the writing... You know, all the writing combined with the text, combined with the crazy art and these, you know, uh, <laughs> super nerdy sci-fi things. If you're not a super nerdy sci-fi nut like myself, you know, might turn some people off, I suppose. Whereas Hero Realms, um, which I will show you briefly um, at the end of all this, uh, is, is sort of stock fantasy. I normally like fantasy on my cards like this, you know, but I prefer the Ascension style where it's like really crazy, different, unique style of art. For this, the glossy, you know, completely over-the-top uh, sci-fi stuff that's not trying to be photorealistic, I actually dig, but back to the game. So those are the factions. Uh, roughly, the Trade Federation faction does a lot of healing. Most of the, uh, I don't think any of the other factions other than um, the Trade Federation do healing. Uh, so that's huge, because... <laughs> Uh, you can force your opponent to to surrender just just you could just because they want the game to end because you're up like 85 you know you've gained 35 health he's lost you know 25 health so he's 25 but you're up 85 to 25 eventually you're gonna win that game and so he'll probably just forfeit so you know if you get a lot of cards with with healing uh, which is authority right which is your your um your health, essentially. Uh, they generally also are, you know, b buyers and spenders. They are the trade federation. So they're, you know, the thematically, you know, the, the preference of giving yourself health over attacking someone else makes a lot of sense. You know, Starfleet is sort of based on that notion. And then, of course, commerce would be an important part. Trade throughout the galaxy would be an important part. But they can do damage. Um, and you, often the damage is in the uh, allied ability, which I'm about to talk about, when you have two or more of the same uh, card that comes out, I'm sorry, the same suit or faction that comes out in the same hand, two or more, then everything with the ally symbol on it is activated. So if you draw four, you know, five cards from the same faction and they have a lot of allied abilities, you are in good shape. The Star Empire does two things extremely well. They can force uh, opponents to discard cards, uh, which is awesome and very frustrating for the other player. Uh, and it's a random discard, so they don't even get to choose. It could be their, their best card. Um, no, sorry, that's not true. They do choose. Back, back it up. That's another game. And drawing cards. Literally, this is the same thing. A little money, draw a card, and if you want to trash this card for good... Force them to discard a card. This trash is drawing a card. And trashing means not going back to your discard pile, but leaving the game for good. You know, now, you know, four damage plus an extra two with an allied ability when they're allied for three cost. That's okay. Uh, th you know, they always have an okay amount of, uh, of, of weapon power, of, of <laughs> weaponry power, of offensive power. Um, and an okay, or an okay amount of uh, monetary power. Rarely do they have both, but because you're drawing so many cards, plus forcing your opponent to discard, because remember, unless, in that, unless the, in that five card hand that you draw each time, one of those cards says draw a card, you ha no matter how powerful your cards are, you only have five cards. So if you can force an opponent, especially late in the game, to discard, let's say, two or three cards, then even if they have two or th three okay cards left in their hand after you force them to do that, nevertheless, this can be very frustrating when you're ready to, when they're ready to drop like 40 points of damage on you. Now all of a sudden it's like 17, which is huge in, in the late game, obviously. All right, here we have the uh, machine uh, cult. They are red. Uh, they do one thing um, in particular. I mean, th they do a lot of damage. There are some that have quite a bit of um, commerce uh, in terms of like go gold, dollars, whatever you want to call it, resources. The yellow symbol, that symbol right there, the yellow symbol, gold, cost up here, gold, right? So I should have gone over this. Name, 
just in case you forget, the machine cult, it, the name of the faction, color and symbol of the faction. Here we go. They do one thing great, which is scrapping cards. And you, you need either a... To win any game, they, they improve this with expansions, but in the initial core set here, in order to win this game, you need to have at least a few yellow draw a card cards that I was telling you about, like this one, or red cards, which scrap cards out of your hand or discard pile. You wanna get rid of these initial cards, these $1, uh, one value scouts and one attack value vipers. You want those out of your hands because you're trying to cycle through your better cards in your hands. So hopefully by the end of the game, if you are operating on all cylinders, you either have a lot of yellow draw cards to get you seven, eight, nine cards right off the bat. Although green cards and blue cards can do that. Um, but what the other cards can't do that you only get with red is scrapping. So that makes red cool because you can win with, with mostly uh, paying for red cards just because their offensive values, while not gaudy, are, are decent for the cost when allied. Um, and so for not a lot of money, you're getting a good amount of firepower, but more importantly, you're getting rid of the cards that are getting in the way of your increasingly good firepower, the shitty ones you start with. And so it's not the number that it seems. This says two damage plus scrap a card if you want, and then another two damage with the allied ability at the bottom there. So that's four damage, let's say, because you got a bunch of red cards. You say, okay, but by scrapping a card, let's say you have only three shitty cards left and you've got a 15 card deck. I don't want to go crazy with the math here, but you basically increase your um, uh, chances of getting a non shitty card at that point by like seven or 8% out of the 15 cards. Now 14 because you scrapped one of your shitty opening hand cards that don't do anything for you later in the game. And so you add that 7% or 15% or 20% depending on, you know, what, what phase you're in of scrapping crappy cards because it gets you back to the more powerful cards more quickly, it allows for chaining because the original cards don't chain with anything. I mean, even when you have a, a, a random, um, I'm sorry, a rare card that says something like, this can be an ally for any faction, it still can't be an ally or do anything. This is literally only one attack no matter what. This is literally only one a dollar, one resource no matter what. So you get back to these four damage cards more quickly and statistically now the damage is five or six and that adds up. And then you start getting more expensive versions. And yes, the red can draw a card as well when allied with the more expensive cards. The, the diff I mean, all four factions have draw card um, availability, but the, the, the main difference is only with yellow does it come with the very inexpensive low-cost cards, ones and twos and threes, whereas it mostly occurs on fives, six, sevens, and eights uh, in the other three factions. And speaking of which, to close it out, we have the blob. Which at first, just like the art, uh, the blob is really representative of my attitude towards the art, which is at first it's like, okay, I love this game and I like the sci-fi theme and I'm okay with the art being a little overly colorful and weird. Over time, the blob becomes the coolest to look at because it's the most original of their designs. They're not copying from other sci-fi properties. And uh, space creatures and space whales are always awesome. Just the notion of giant living beings that live in space and by and through space is so cool. The blob's main thing that they do well, other than just massive offensive power, and once you get up to the higher cost cards, or seven cost, you're going to get a lot of attack power and a lot of draw cards, um, uh, including in the primary ability, even without the ally. But now this one's two draws. Uh, you know That's when green gets super powerful, when you can start affording it. But they're, here's an only a, a two-cost card. And this card's brilliant, Battle Pod. Okay, so that red one we just looked at was two primary, which means it activates no matter what, and two ally if you have one or more other green, or let's say two or more green cards in your hand at any point or in play. So let's assume that there are other, another green card in play. So it's six damage, and you may scrap a card in the trade row. So for me, this is the by far the least important part. Um, I'm sorry, special ability of the four factions. And while Blue Trade Federation can do a lot, 
its its uh, quote unquote power or special ability is essentially that it can that it can increase your effective health, your authority. You know, so you can all of a sudden have 60, 70 health early in the game, and you get your opponent down to thirty two. All of a sudden, it's looking pretty bad for them, especially because the tr- the Blue Trade Federation at higher cost does have offense, um, and even the low cost cards with the ally ability have a decent amount of offense. It's four right there. I mean, this card's just ridiculous. This is considered one of the best cards in the game at two, even if you're not playing blue. But, uh, you know, while um, yellow Star Empire, uh, green um, Blob, and a red Machine Cult, while their special abilities, as I've described them to you just now, are written here. D- discard a card, as I said, with the yellow, draw a card. Um, the, 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 the Trade Federation is just, and they do, they do so many things good, and they can do things like gain authority, uh, increase your health that none of the others can do. So, so, but the reason I'm saying this is the most irrelevant to me, scrap a card in the trade row, sometimes it's two cards, you know, um, you would think that would be cool because you're like, oh, I know my opponent because he's playing a lot of red, is looking for that really good red card in the trade row, right? And he's going to be able to afford it because we're in mid game right now. So five, six bucks he can afford. But I'm going to go first and trash it so he can't get it. The problem is you don't know what's replacing it from the draw deck. And therefore, uh, it suddenly becomes, you know, a, a, a dice roll as to whether it's really going to help him. And if you're destroying two that are just valuable because you can't afford them at the time, which is, you know, what most people do and what I do, if you've got nothing else to do, but then you might get cards that are more expensive or even less relevant to you and certainly not something that your opponent's interested in thereby you know screwing him over but the reality is there's tons of like medium level attack value on the green cards and enough draw cards that if you just start stocking up on green from the beginning uh, spoiler alert, the main problem in, in Star Realms, the initial deck here, is green is way overpowered. Uh, with Colony Wars, the, the full expansion and the other cards, they balance it out much better. And that's my main argument for getting the other cards, is not to just have more Star Realms and give them more money, but that, that they balance the game. Green is ex- green and red, in particular, uh, together, are such a deadly combination in, in the initial game. Um, and see, if you play with like kids who are smart or, or just adults who are good at games, they'll pick up on that very quickly. And so then it becomes a race for the green cards. But, you know, in general, you can still win with a, a, a you know, two or three factions. Um, it, you'll probably end up with at least one card from each of the four factions by the end of the game. But you should be aiming for two sort of majors. Like if this were college, you want a double major and a minor or a major and a double minor in terms of the faction. So two, str- two uh, a lot of, one an okay amount of, or one a ton of like greens uh, <laughs> in the main game. And then like a little red, a little blue or something. Or a little red to get card- crappy cards out of your hand. And a little yellow uh, to get the draw a card, discard a card stuff to screw over your opponent and get more cards into your hands. So let's go to the trade row and see what we have. All right, folks. So I'm just going to do a couple hands here to show the process and a little bit of the strategy. <clears throat> Again, as usual, for any game that I do that's also available at this location, uh, being Will Wheaton's Tabletop. Free on YouTube. Definitely watch him play. Melissa, I forget her last name, who's a legitimate, like, competitive magic player that goes on, like, tournaments and tours and so forth. Um, <clears throat> they have a great Star Realms epic uh, battle. It's the only two-player game he's ever done, you know, in, like, a hundred pl- episodes of, or more of Tabletop. He only did one two-player game. It's always four or five people, depending on the game, usually four. Uh, and But they made it super fun, and it, it is way more fun, even if you're a little skeptical at this point point uh will does a great job of explaining it and then through watching them and the graphics that come up on screen that i just don't have the budget or time to do does a great job of explaining the game i wanted to talk more about breaking down the factions the values and the strategy and so i'm going to show you a little bit of the strategy with a couple quick rounds here between my two imaginary players um 
and then uh, we'll wrap this baby up. Really quickly, I keep forgetting. The main criticism in the initial uh, set was that these counters, which are double-sided, 1, 5, 20, 10, etc., to keep track of your authority or your health, your effective health, well, they look cool, and it's actually a good teaching tool for kids with math. I mean, even high school kids had trouble doing this on the fly. The problem is, unless you are specifically teaching math with these cards, the, the, there's so many turns where it's like one damage, two damage, three damage, like these little micro damage, that you're constantly moving these cards around, and it becomes too much of the game. People mostly just ditched it, and there's, you know, you get a lot of free counters on the iPhone and so forth. Uh, that you know that magic users use or people use to keep track of their resources or whatever things to save time and keep the game flowing yet another reason to play the app you know you don't have to deal with any of that score keeping um, again I like the mathy part of this but because it's 50 points to 50 points and no one ever goes above 100 you know it's 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 low level arithmetic but it's enough to kind of keep your mind sharp um, and so what they did with Hero Realms and they brought into future version of Star Realms, um, one of the advantages, as I mentioned, of uh, Hero Realms, uh, which, we, which we won't have time for today, unfortunately, um, uh, other than I'll just show you the, the box and the cards, um, is uh, that you, their, their character packs, unfortunately, are sold separately and a little too expensive for what they are, uh, but give asymmetrical pa starting powers to each side in Hero Realms, um, you know, sort of like, uh, let's put it this way, considering that both players can draw from the same factions and draw from the same cards is the whole point of deck building, and so in some ways the, uh, having unique characters, especially at the start, is against the spirit of deck building. I like it in Hero Realms in particular, it needed a different mechanic. Um, and, and so, and also, so you don't have to start with all these super low cost cards that can take a while to ramp up. Although I enjoy that part of the game. So, anyways, Hero Realms counter. So, we have 50 points 51, 52, 53, 54. Now we're really dying. 15, 14, 13, etc. It's so obvious, uh, and it would have saved space for a couple more cards. Like sometimes the Explorers, the two cost two value cards run out if you don't have a second set. Um, and uh, you'll listen uh, uh, to um, the the second part of, of the podcast where I talk a little bit more about accessories and expansions. But the one, if you are really into Star Realms, it's worth getting the Colony Realm second box. That's also, you know, 10 to 15 bucks. To not just to double your card pool, but to balance things out, to give you way more explorers. Um, and, and balance the factions a little bit more, make the game more interesting. After that, it just got to be too much. And that's usually the case with all card games. We'll have to keep the history and philosophy of tabletop card games uh, to a minimum because I can always talk about it forever. It's, it's fascinating. So, all right. So we will uh, ditch the old school counters for now. In fact, we're going to ditch the new school counters. I'm not even going to keep track of attacks because we're not going to get far enough where anyone's going to lose, but I'll tell you how much money we get per turn, how much attack we get per turn, if it's blue cards, the Trade Federation, if we get any more health through the, the green symbol of authority or effective health, um, and uh, I'll show you what choices I make when I play this a lot on the app and occasionally when I can with, with friends. So we start with two attack and two gold. Now there's different ways of keeping track because ultimately you're going to play every card. There's almost no situation where you don't play cards. The only situation you don't play a card is sometimes there's a one or two cost card that you don't want to buy because it's actually making your deck weaker. Like late in the game, there's some one or two cost cards you just don't want because it's now weakening your deck by taking up a spot. So instead of 14 really strong cards, now you have 14 really strong cards and one super weak card with each draw. And, and th these games can be so close. I can't tell you how many times I've won a game literally by zero, one, or two points, essentially. Meaning getting them down exactly to zero, which with 20 to 30 turns total, uh, 10 to 15 apiece, um, you know, the chances of, of eliminating someone by zero points, meaning getting them exactly to zero, starting at 50, is very low statistically, has happened to me a bunch of times. That's how well balanced this game is. So, you have to keep track of which cards you use, and then it goes 
into your discard pile, which I'm going to put to the uh, the outside here. So I'm just saying I'm going to hit him for two damage. P this guy, pa pow, pa pow. Okay, I've used those two cards. Now I've got three spending power. So here are my options. The two bases on the board are both four bucks. You can't probably see it from here. Are both four bucks, so I can't afford it with my three. So here's what I can do. These three cards are available. Trade Federation is a one cost, and then green and red are two cost. Of course, there's also the two cost explorers. So you always want to use all your money if you can. You don't want to buy the, let's say, seven cost card necessarily if you like the six cost card better. But generally, the higher cost cards are weighted for value and worth. Meaning, even at the high levels, usually an eight cost card is slightly better than a seven cost card, as you would expect, but not always. And it depends, obviously, with faction and strategy you're playing. But early on, you want to get as many ships as possible. And so you're not going to, you know, even if you had uh, four uh, to spend, you might not want to buy one of those bases because you want to get numerous cards in your deck early on that are better than your shitty ones that you start with. And so this is your whole strategy. Let's assume you want to get two two of these. Well, it's got to be with three spending power. It's got to be the one and then one of the twos. So you're going to get this, right? Gives you two. This is a great deal, right? You're going, well, wait. The Explorer costs two and gives you two. And this costs one. Not only gives you two trade, but if you pair it up with another Trade Federation chip, uh or base with the ally ability gives you four authority, which is essentially doing four damage. Well, the reason it only costs one is because you need to commit to the Trade Federation uh, uh, in your deck building to make the second part work, which a lot of people don't necessarily do. And what the Explorer has that makes it even more valuable is that you can scrap it for two and cost two damage, because that's a double effect of you know, let's say I, I have so much spending. Let's say I have so much uh, uh, trade in, in my hand that a two isn't worth that much or that I have all the ships I need and now I actually want to get rid of weaker ships. It allows you to get it out of your deck without having to use a red card, which again has, you know, the scrap a card from your hand or discard pile ability. You don't even need it with this. You just trash it and you get two to hit the opponent. And there's lots of times even early games when they put a, a powerful base out there and let's say the base has five hit points, uh, and you have four uh, at the moment. You still say you have four attack value on the board. Well, I don't want to get rid of this early game because I want to keep the spending power. But that base is just killing me, and so I'll spend the extra. I'll trash it, get it out of my hand in the game for good. But I'll get two more attack, and with six, I can take down that five hit point base. But this early on, the choice for me is simple which is, I want that three. I mean, you know, adding a, 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 forget about the two damage that might be caused later if you get more blob cards. You don't even need another blob card. Anything with three or four trade, I mean, just statistically with a five card hand, it is so amazing. I mean, theoretically, if you have five of them, that's 15, which is a seven cost card and an eight cost card, which can completely change the game no matter when it happens. So you want that three no matter what, especially for two, um, is an amazing value. And you don't, again, you don't have to commit to green. Red cards, unless you're going all red um, and just not use this. I mean, here's the thing. If you get two or three red cards early and you keep using the scrap ability, yes, it's nice to get rid of those 10 initial cards that have almost no worth or value, but then the ability becomes worthless because you don't want to start scrapping the good cards that you've been spending your hard-earned money on. So you do want to get a red card in the one or two red cards in there uh, fairly early, but not at the beginning. And you certainly don't need the offensive power of two versus three spending. So I'm going to get the three spending green card, and I'm going to take the Federation shuttle for a one. I put that in my discard pile, and then I throw all the other cards back in the discard pile. And that is literally the turn. Now, if I had uh, no cards left, uh, I would shuffle. And that's what happens. You run a card, you shuffle. I still have five. So for the next turn, I'll still have five to use. And we already know what five they're going to be because we played the two Vipers. And we know there are eight Scouts. There's five more Scouts. So I'm pumped. 
hopefully hoping for good cards to come out. There's already two bases worth four that are good bases. I have to explain the difference between uh, a normal base and an outpost as well. Um, uh, but I'm excited about having five spending next turn. Okay, well now, other than the explorers, there's only three cards in the trade row because I bought two. So, all right, so the player one bought two. So we got another uh, base, the Royal Redoubt, which has six hit points and is an outpost, which is super potent if you get it early in the game. As I'll explain in a sec. Ooh, and the freighter. The freighter is amazing. I told you if you have three or more, any card with three or more uh, trade value, three or more bucks, dollars, credits, whatever you want to call them, uh, economy on them, you want to get. Well, this one not only has four, yes, it costs four, but who cares? Because you're going to be cycling every time through four, you know, even late game, having four trade value on one card is awesome when you need that one card. But not only that, if you if you throw a few, and this is an important card strategically, because this is a card if you're on the fence about whether you want to go blue as one of your primaries. <laughs> yes, it's a primary color. But I mean, if you want to go with the Trade Federation, the blue faction, as one of your main factions, you have to make the decision here. Now remember, we already bought the... the Federation shuttle. So, you know, we're already heading that direction. I got a green card, and I told you that green is good, both in the, especially in the core set, but in the game in general. Let me fix the pile here. So, all we need is a couple more blue cards for this special ability, which reads, you may put the next ship you acquire this turn on the top of your deck. So, that's amazing. Because now you know that if not this hand, the next hand... Let's say, whoops, let me get a good card. So let's say you're a few rounds in and you can afford the insane mother's blob mothership, which has six attack, uh, draw a card, and a second draw a card if, if you're stocking up on the blob. We've already decided player one is going to do, uh, I've decided, <laughs> is going to do blue trade federation because he's going to get this freighter. Um, or, or let's, I mean, he's, he may not get the freighter in the sample game here, but in the real game, he would take the freighter if it was still available. Like I said, he has five spending coming. He can easily spend the four. And so what's great is if your ally ability kicks in, and let's say you buy this ridiculous card. So instead of going to the discard pile and having to wait for it to come back around, you put it on the top of the deck until you know it's coming up. But here's where it gets even crazier. Let's say... You also have this card in your current hand. Survey ship. Draw a card. Well, if you play the order right, you put out one blue card, then you put this out, and as many cards as you need to afford the seven cost. But with two blue ships, now this kicks in. And now it says, okay, so whatever you buy from now on, you put at the top of the deck instead of the discard pile. So I, now I buy the green ship and put it on the top of the deck, but I've been saving my yellow draw card. So now I draw the yellow card... Or, I sorry, I play the yellow card, and what's the next card on the de deck? The one I just put there, the Ridiculous Mothership. And since this is a late game pull, uh, a purchase, and a late game pull, uh, we've already committed to the blob. And even if you haven't committed to the blob, six plus draw a card is spectacular, even if you have one or two other blob cards. So that is how you chain and, and prepare for chain events. Let's see what the other player has, and then... Uh, I think two turns is enough, you understand where this is going. The fun of this game is not learning tons of rules, it's more like resistance, even if the game's nothing like resistance. I don't want another spell, uh, want to ship, here we go. Um, it, even the game's nothing like resistance, uh, but it, it's similar in the sense of it plays quickly, it's easy to learn, and the fun is in the variation of each game that you play, not that there's so many crazy mechanics. I mean, that's literally it. It's mostly attack and, and gold or trade value, and then you can heal yourself occasionally, and then there's effect like discard a card or scrap a card or draw a card or force an opponent to discard a card, etc., 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 and that is basically the game. So let's go really quickly. We'll draw one, two, three, four, five. Ah, so player two gets five uh, scouts in his first turn, which means I can afford anything other than the Royal Redoubt. And you go, okay, three attack value and target just 
opponent discards a card, but you need more yellow for that to happen. That seems like a lot for a six. And if you have a lot of the expansions, this becomes a little less valuable. But in the initial core set, having a base with six hit points, meaning the other pl player one, if player two was able to purchase this, and he puts it out there when he plays it, and the base sits there until you destroy it. So he has it every turn, so that's three free attack value every turn. So now, a few turns, you're nine attack, 12 attack, 15 attack. So it's worth it just for that. But then you get six hit points. If you get this within the first five to ten turns of the game, the other player is not going to have enough offensive firepower for the most part if he's prioritizing trade, which is what I do and what most people do if you're playing the odds. Um, and, and so it just sits there. And then, of course, this is another card you may not build your entire deck around as you build it, but if you're already leaning yellow or on the fence, like maybe I'll get some yellow among my two or three primary factions that I'm going to focus on, uh, this might swing you if you already have a couple yellow cards to keep getting yellow. And then it also triggers discard a card. So now it's really valuable because doing three things is protecting your ass so you're not losing health points. It's attacking each turn it's out there, and bases stay out there until they're destroyed. And now it's causing, with all your yellow cards, target to discard a card. Now, really quickly, out, there's, this is Outpost. This base right here, see it's just a silver shield versus the Outpost? It's, it's this simple. Outpost must be destroyed before you can do further dam direct damage to the other player. These do not. In general, even the best players online who are like level 30 players, which is, I can't tell you how many games or how good you have to be to be level 30 online. It's, it's insane. But in general, most bases, if they do anything, because, you know, if they're sitting out there, even this base, which isn't a super powerful base, is giving my opponent two health or two bucks, you know, normally you see these get destroyed no matter what. But the bottom line is, late in the game, if you have, you know, 18 health and they're doing 21 damage, this literally saves your butt. Especially if you're about to beat them and you just need to survive one more turn because they have to destroy this first with 6. Now they have 15 damage instead of 21. They bring me down to 3 with my 18. Minus 15 is 3. And now I have enough health. You only need one to survive. And I'm alive and I can do my final turn and take them down. So it works early game and it works late game all right so with five bucks again i can get one of the two four cost bases i showed you one this yellow base this is again if you're just using the core set does a lot of cool things it does two damage um it's only four health uh hit points but it is an outpost so it must be destroyed so that's nice it does four total damage if you have a lot of yellow cards so you buy if you if you're already stacking up on yellow cards this is a no-brainer for four cost but also, it, you can scrap it for four bucks, so if you get it early on to stop attacks on you, but now your opponent is easily putting out five plus damage a turn, so you're gonna lose this card and it's not gonna be doing much for you. And let's say you're not collecting yellow either, then you say, screw it, I'd rather buy that super expensive card on the board because I'm gonna get four bucks from this from trashing it, which is basically the most you can get on any card uh, in, in the core set. And so it, it's, it's very versatile. And, and so in that way, it's doing three or four different things. And that's ultimately why I prefer this to Hero Realms, which I'm gonna show you when I spin the camera back around in a second to do uh, closing thoughts. So I could buy one of the bases, but I'm trying to maximize my spending early on where I have five bucks. And so, you know what? My opponents, and this is it. I mean, this is what's great about the game is sometimes it's like, it's like Taoism. It's like, the, so, you know, a, a little Western philosophy. So Western philosophy and Western religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, are obsessed with the notion of free will. Do we actually make choices? Do we actually have the ability to make choices, right? And game theory talks about this all the time, you know? And, and, and that's why, it, you know, games like chess are held up with such, or, or Go in, in the East are held up with such reverence is because they seem like simple games, but they're actually like not only life lessons, but philosophical lessons about how the world works and so forth on both the microcosm and macrocosmic level. <laughs> where am I going with this? What I'm saying is in Eastern religions, but especially like Taoism, where you're supposed to follow the, the easiest and clearest and best path of the way, 
they're not really concerned with you know some metaphysical truth about whether you're making those choices or not. It does say you should follow the path of the way, not you will follow it. So you are making choices. I believe that there is radical free will actually in Eastern religions, and you're going Bizzle, Really, where are you going with this? Well, my opponent, by semi necessity, in terms of the limited options available to him or her, just bought a blue and a green card, and now by semi necessity, semi availability, I have a red, a pretty good red and a pretty good yellow card to start the game, and so I'm going. You know what? There's there's two more yellow cards out there already. That blue station isn't that powerful. Red, like I said, is always good to, to scrapping your crappy cards and cycling the better cards at, around um, as you shuffle and, and draw those five cards each, each hand. Um, and I immediately off the bat, in addition to the two damage uh, from the missile bot, I'm going to be getting four damage um, and a target opponent discards a card. So late in the game, if you can force, this is the trick with yellow, is late in the game, discarding one card to your opponent isn't that powerful because they have a really powerful hand, one to five. But if you if you commit to yellow early on and stick with it, or, or make a switch over to it and prioritize it late game, getting two or three especially discards on your opponent can really screw up their chaining effects which might require three or even four cards to be fully realized um, but on top of that with more yellow cards you get an additional two damage so that's six but even better if you decide not to stick with your yellow strategy and that's why you can scrap a lot of the yellow cards because they're meant for short-term you know gambits or tactics uh, then you can scrap it for draw and draw a card with the scrap. So you get it out of your hand because you no longer need it and you're not focusing on yellow and you get to draw a card and, while making your hand more efficient. And that's basically the way it goes. Now again, you have to be careful because on the one, on the one side, player one took two cards that had you know very good trade, a two trade and a three trade. So they're gonna have a lot of spending power so, so far, if I, if I buy these two cards, as opposed to, let's say, an op another option, one that I might do actually on the first round, is do this for five, two, and three. Because uh, even though the Explorer you know, isn't super powerful without scrapping it, having that two uh, trade value added in there, because this is just pure offense, there's nothing economic about the, the yellow Imperial frigate. I might take the two trade value, but let's say... I bought. I did buy the uh, Star Empire and Machine Cult cards, and look, I want to point out the bases that are out there. Unless you scrap this, this is all about attack power. This is pure. I mean, it is defending you, but otherwise, it's attack power. Meaning, next turn, whether there are cards on the board or not that have a trade value, you know, dollars that I can add to my, my deck collection, my set collection, then I'm going to, I need to buy explorers. You can't go into the second round just with, again, one value scouts because you're going to get nailed by the other guy who's putting out two and three val uh, resource um, uh, value cards, uh, you know, in a five card hand and he's buying up all the good cards and that is something you can't recover from. You need to still be buying early game even when the optimal move seems to be to take these two cards you it's all about and i'll leave you guys with this and we'll do final thoughts it's really all about when you buy the cards most of the cards in the game especially the core set are useful at some point and that's part of the brilliance of it but it's all about when you buy it you know some cards like i talked about the cutter not the country cutter like guitar like this freighter with the four spending and put a card on the top of your deck, depending on your strategy, is either always useful or only useful in the early mid game. It's possible late game, you just want attack power. And so this does zero attack power other than potentially add a, you know attack heavy card to the top of your deck, which is something you need to consider. But in terms of buying this card late game, you, you might that would be the one time you might not. You know, the mothership you always buy when it's available, even if it prevents you from buying the equivalent of two to three other ships. You can't deny this, and you and you certainly, if you are able to get this early, like because let's say you have the freighter, if you have the freighter and you, then you draw a bunch of scouts uh, as your other four, that's eight bucks. The mothership costs quote unquote only seven. You have to take it early game, even though it makes your deck 
a little vulnerable because you got to fill it out with some more powerful cards. But you start now, now you have a mission. You have a sense of purpose. You say, I'm going after green cards. I'm going after green. I'm going to supplement it with, let's say, yellow or red. But I'm going after green to keep those draw cards come in and heavy attack value. Boom. And again, at two cost, the cutter is great any point. Because even if you're not playing blue at late game, and so you won't be able to get the allied ability with the four damage, being able to heal yourself for... Um, by itself is worth $2 uh, late game when every hit point, every health point or authority point as they call it matters. So that's my state of the game. Um, again, I, I would recommend watching Will, uh, Will Wheaton's show on it, but I want to do a little bit more in-depth strategy. It is time, as always, to break out in the wield Sting. Still no blue glow, but one day, if orcs come, I'll be set. Okay. So, a couple pieces of business here. First of all, this is literally, ignore the boxes back there other than the middle one. This box, right here, everything in it is out on the table. You've got your starting decks, you've got your scorecards, but mostly you've got ships and bases with crazy kind of trippy drawings from that deck right here, the draw deck, this is the trade row, and I'm going to explain the mechanics of how you start the game, how you start buying cards, how you improve your deck, and that's what deck building is. Now, I highly recommend that you uh, check out, um, I think, episode two, where I do just a 15 minute or so uh, historical recap, as I see it. Um, or as I know it, I should say, about the uh, genre of deck building um, in the literal sense of building a deck. And this is the confusing thing. Uh, if you see the, like the back of the cards, the Star Realms, a deck building game. Hero Realms says Hero Realms, a deck building game. So really quickly, the difference between games that involve building a deck and deck building with a capital D, the genre, is that deck building with a capital D, the genre, the, a lot of the game is actually building your deck. Buying cards, improving your deck, getting rid of bad cards, and getting more and more efficient to chain huge attacks and eventually take down your opponent. That is how a deck building game works. Now there's some variations on it, like Ascension, from which this game came from. And Ascension, other than... Ascension, other than having just absolutely beautiful and crazy fantasy art and kind of conf uh, wide range of rules that aren't that confusing to initiate one after another. Um, but the problem with Ascension is there's just too many effects. And so while each individual effect, and I'll explain what an effect is uh, when we get to Star Realms, well, each individual effect is executable even by a new person just by following the text on the card. The overall strategy has never made itself apparent to me. Um, but we, we will perhaps get back there because this game uh, literally came from Ascension and then at least one Ascension designer came from here. And of course everything um, in the deck building genre comes from, excuse me, comes from Dominion. Um, but check out that video for more of a history. But basically there's three kinds and it's sort of three waves of, of games that involve building a deck. The first wave, of course, is Magic. And I actually have some magic cards. I don't do anything with them, but I have a few lying around. So, magic, they just keep adding more and more cards, although you can't use all of them in tournaments. There are rules. This isn't Nam. There are rules. Um, but you still have to buy thousands of cards, uh, ultimately, to continually be a viable magic player, even if you're a... Uh, or I should say, if you are any good and want to do that, or you just like to compete... Then you need to buy a lot of cards. But with magic, the, the central mechanic is building your whole deck ahead of time. Now, there is random draws in magic, and that's the main thing they pioneered that carried forward to Star Realms, is the notion of, well, you might know which cards are in your deck, 
Um, and that's true of Star Realms as well. It's just that you don't start with them, but you ultimately roughly know what cards are in your deck. You just don't know what order they're going to come out and if they were going to chain the way that you want to, both in terms of how much they cost and how much damage they do or how much power they have. But you still built your deck ahead of time. That wasn't part of the in-game experience. Now, this the second wave is uh, the uh, uh, the card the living card game genre, Arkham Horror, uh, Lord of the Rings, the, uh, the living card game. They're almost all by Fantasy Flight Games, um, who I talked about when I did episode one, which was a Game of Thrones, the card game. Now, as you can see, you have a bunch of the houses from Game of Thrones there, and it's exactly like magic in the sense of you build your hand ahead of time with 60 cards and you roughly know what is in that 60 card deck. However, the difference is you don't buy random packs in living card games. So the only difference between games like Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon and the living card game genre, so the collective, so CCGs, collectible card games versus LCGs, living card games, the main difference is only that you know which cards you are getting in the living card game packs it's not necessarily much cheaper if you want all the cards, but at least you know ahead of time what is going to be in those packs. That, of course, is th the case with Star Realms, Halo Realms, everything in deck building genre, the initial uh, core set or, or core pack, which is what we're dealing with here. You know what's in that pack, every single card, even if you buy things that come in those, you know, glossy, uh, like Fleer uh, style um, uh, card packs. In Magic, you don't know what cards or even what kind of cards uh, or what level of rarity the cards are going to be in each pack. You're just rolling and die like with loot boxes, video games. Um, with every single uh, expansion or addition to games like Star Realms, you know it is in those packs. And so you might still end up spending a lot of money, um, but at least you know what you're spending your money on. And, and you can gauge, do I care about being competitive in games like this or even just having a more complicated experience with more cards and more mechanics, uh, or am I cool just the core set, or maybe I'll go somewhere in the middle and buy a few things. So that was the, the living card game genre with games like Game of Thrones. You are building your deck, but then you are drawing somewhat randomly. Now with Game of Thrones, uh, if you watch that video really quickly, tries to mitigate some of the luck of your draw with these location cards. Um, because unlike your 60 card draw deck in Game of Thrones, which like in Star Realms is always a random number of cards, it's seven generally drawn in Game of Thrones, and most of the deck, uh, modern deck building games in the deck building genre, this, Hero Realms, Ascension, etc., it's usually five cards per draw, but then you get cards that say draw a card, blah, 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 blah. Um, <clears throat> so the Game of Thrones is, you know, you, you know what you're getting, there, there's, there are too many cards, uh, but they don't really, you know, they don't release nearly at the rate of um, of collectible card games. And you know, I played Star Wars Destiny for a while, which is basically Star Wars Magic: The Gathering, but with uh, dice and awesome Star Wars characters. So the mechanic, you know, the, the the I guess what I'm trying to say, guys, is there's the mechanics in the game itself, but then there's the mechanics of how you buy the game, how much you pay, you know, how much you need to get, and so forth. And that's sort of the connection I'm trying to make is that. Living card games are more like old school collectible card games in how in that you build your deck in advance, whereas living card games in the store buying experience uh, is more similar to modern deck builders like Star Realms because you know what you're getting and don't have to buy random packs. Okay, a couple more pieces of business and then uh, uh, we will get into setup and playthrough. So first of all, let's see, where did I put the box? Well, the Star Wars Realms box is undeniably badass, more so for its size than anything else. It advertises the free app right here on the side if you just want to play the core set. And, you know, like, even though I bought a bunch of the expansions on the App Store for the awesome app, uh, which I'll show you uh, later uh, really quickly if we have time, um, I still end up playing the core, just the core set, uh, which is what's here more than half the time, I would say. Although part of that's just because it's easier to find competitors um, for it. It says 20 minutes, two players, 12 plus. 20 minutes is a very good um, 
uh, estimate. It, the games actually take 10 to 12 minutes if you play online, for, I would say, but that's things just move more, much more quickly. You don't have to phys physically shuffle, move the cards, there's a timer, and so forth. White Wizard Games, they're the guy who, uh, who made it. The game designed by Darwin Castle. I, I don't know if that's the guy from Ascensions, but, but there was some crossover into this new company and new venture. So while it's great to break this out, because it says, it says everything you need right at the front, gaudy science fiction, but it's a deck building game. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's, it's, it's very frayed. And this is just one that I break out at home, occasionally travel with. It's, it's, it's very thin stock cardboard. It's not necessarily cheap, it's just thin. And so, unlike the big expensive games that can retail for 80, 90, $100, and unless you have tons of disposable income, you pretty much have to uh, buy it online out of necessity, uh, you know, like to get an $80 game for 40 or $45. Um, but for smaller stuff, you really should support your local game shop. This is the perfect thing because this is going to be literally $14.95 whether you get it online, um, maybe more with shipping. So, you know, they sell it to you $12.95 online, but then there's at least $3 $4 shipping. Uh, just buy this at your, your local game store. It's $15.00. All the game you need. You really don't need the expansions. Now, I I bought um, uh, the one full length expansion, which was an equal size box and also fifteen dollars called Colony Wars, and it literally just doubled the number of ships, and they're completely different ships. So essentially, all I did for then is go from this many cards to this many cards. Now they've added a bunch of other uh, things. Um, into the gameplay, uh, gambits, which are one-use cards that do something uh, one time. You have to trash it. You can use it any time that you start the game with. You've got heroes, which work the same exact way, but they come in to the uh, trade pile, and you buy it with the... Oops, move the camera. And you... Uh, I'm sorry. And you buy it from the trade pile and then put it in your hand immediately, um, or on your board immediately, I should say. Um, and, uh, and then you can use it once. They also have events, which are, are by far, the, you know, the, the, the one thing, I don't usually use Heroes and Gambits, but events I'll never use, because they're random events that pop up in the trade deck, you have to immediately do it. Now, because it affects both players, you know, it's not unfair in that sense, uh, but random events in a game like this, you specifically do because you've played it a million times. And you just want a different experience. Or, you know, you play against your buddy, not very competitively. But you guys love the game, you know, killing time, uh, like an old school card game. That's part of why I love games like this uh, is because of the small box and relatively easy to understand mechanics. It's also for factions and all of these games, just like the four suits um, in, uh, you know, traditional 52 card playing card pack. Um, but events, you know, are, are, are forced things that make more sense in, like, board games, you know, miniature war games. Not miniature war games, but, like, you know, board games with plastic miniatures that you're... Dudes on a map, as they say, um, where those games can go very long. The occasional random event could be cool. These games are already so short. Um, the, the events essentially just accelerate the game and add a little bit of randomness. Totally unnecessary. So everything that I use is in this box, you know, which is still pretty insane. You know, it's this small. They do sell play mats for all these games, you know, that show you, like, not just show you, but very pr prettily display your trade row, your discard pile, you know, and players can have their play mats. I mean, these two yellow things are play mats. I, I promise the Game of Thrones. Uh, I have two Tyrells coming in, I believe. Which I love the Tyrells. Uh, Margie and, and the Queen of Thorns, uh, if you watch the Game of Thrones video. So those will be coming in soon. Uh, but I'm, I'm also uh, thinking of projecting... I, I think this, this yellow color is green enough that a green screen effect would work on it. So I could put like a star field uh, back here, which would be pretty awesome. Uh, but anyways, back to the game. So yes, it is, is small even with expansions. Uh, and if you if you want recommendations or want to know more about expansions, just write in the comments and I will respond to you. So get rid of that box. So you go to the friendly game store, you introduce yourself, 
They show you around, so you say, I'm going to look around for a while, then you go to the Star Realms shelf and you get the Star Realms. And then, as you come to the counter, you buy one of these $3 Ultra Pro deck boxes, which are, you know, are so good and cheap that they don't even really have competition in the market. I mean, it's, it's you know, very, I mean, you know, if there was 50 pounds on it for three hours, I guess it would dent. Uh, but the top stays closed. You can write it on the top, Star Realms. I know it's not as sexy or fun, but once the people see the cards and they come out of the box, it won't matter. So you buy one of those, boom, less than $20. You got yourself not only a game, but a game with tons of replayability, portability, accessibility, um, and I just think one of the most brilliant game designs out there on the market. It's also highly addictive, um, as games like, like this can be. Um, uh, and uh, but it's also one of the only games that I've played online ever extensively is you know play online Star Realms with a great 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 app. All right, folks. Bears beats Battlestar Galactica. Ten points if you know that reference. That was Star Realms. Thank you for joining me. It went on longer than I wanted to. I was considering cutting out the final section, which was more discussion about deck building and the Star Realms expansions, but I figure I put in table contents in the video and in the, in the feed, and if you just want to watch the introduction to the game and a little gameplay and strategy, you can just do that. Um, but if you're still here, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'll be coming back soon. My Tyrell Game of Thrones play mats came in, and so the table's looking amazing, way better than with the, those yellow mats which are just placeholders. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, closing thoughts, it's again, it's one of my favorite games, as I said in the intro and throughout the video, you know, for, for $15, it, it's not only good value because the cards are great stock, even though the box, you know, needs to be replaced with something stronger, as I said. Um, but the cards themselves are incredibly hi um, high uh, card stock. They fray a little on the edges, but you can only notice because it's black borders. You know, hardcore gamers are always talking about get rid of black borders on cards because otherwise you wouldn't see it fray because it's it's very very faint. It doesn't really matter though. It just adds to the you know the quality of it, like an old deck of uh, like playing cards, and that's the best thing I compare it to. Like if you're sick of playing all the same games which aren't that many or that interesting, and you don't want to play bridge or like a really complicated card game, uh, you know, advanced card game then this is it. It's, you know, it's more cards, but it's essentially the same thing, but it has a deck building mechanic, different themes, um, and, uh, but it's still four suits or, you know, factions or, or, you know, colors or whatever you want to call it. So I can't recommend it highly enough. Now, if you're, it, the cards are a little bright and gaudy and there's a little too much going on with, with the numbers and the text, um, and you want something a little bit more laid back, but has essentially the same exact same mechanics then i would i would recommend because it's only like 20 bucks um hero realms now you can tell it's a bigger box but it's much 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 better quality it has a few more cards in it you know the, in order to in order to create the small box they had to cut some corners in terms of number of like extra cards um, and so forth this does not suffer from that whatsoever in fact there's a little extra room in here um for some of the expansions um, which are mostly character packs, uh, which I'll show you in, in a second. Um, now, Star Realms did kickstart uh, what I call 2.0, because it's not a second edition. It's not meant to replace the old edition. It's certainly not better. Star Realms Frontiers, and so they copied the size and quality of the um, Hero Realms box. But, you know, the busyness and over bright, overly brightness, uh, oh, sorry, overly bright uh, Star Wars Frontiers box versus the Hero Realms box very much uh, captures the difference in aesthetics between the two. I would definitively not buy this over the original game. If you want this many Star Realms cards for, for essentially the same amount of money, because this probably retails for 25, 30 bucks, then get this and the Colony Wars that I was telling you about, which is exactly the size and full of exactly this many cards, but all brand new, but some extra scouts, vipers, explorers, and so forth as I showed you in the game. So don't get this unless you, you're just desperate for new cards because these are all advanced level cards. Um, and uh, if anything, they imitate something I don't love about Hero Realms, uh, but it also makes Hero Realms 
more accessible, I think, and I'll show you a couple cards and we'll wrap up, which is right off the bat, you have more powerful cards, even in your opening hand, and the cards do much higher damage, uh, you know, <laughs> at once, um, as opposed to ramping up the damage slowly and methodically in Star Realms, where you're doing three damage, five damage, ten. Now there's also great, there's also a lot of healing in Hero Realms, but in general, if you chain early in Hero Realms, the games will go faster. So let me just show you the difference really quickly. And again, if you prefer the more spa, the sparse artwork of uh, Hero Realms, uh, then that combined with the uh, somewhat, I would say, easy, easy uh, greater ease of play uh, w w might be the um, might tip the scales in favor of Hero Realms. The backs are certainly cool. I love the Hero Realms backs, but you start with ten cards that are a combination of low combat and low uh, trade or gold in Hero Realms, and you draw five just like in Star Realms. The difference is while you do have one one uh, damage dagger like the Viper. You your other damage card that you start with is a two damage uh, short sword. So you've already increased your opening uh, damage in your original ten cards that both players get at the beginning of the game. You've already increased it by fifty percent. Now you do get. Let's see how many is this six. You do get six of the gold, which are like the scouts, which are just worth $1, and you want to replace as quickly as possible. But you also get a ruby, and there's something called a fire gem in the game as well, which is also worth two, and is exactly the explorer, which is it's two, uh, two gold, and you can scrap it for two damage. It's the same exact thing. This, though, again, means that in an opening hand in hero rounds, the most you could get in Star Realms was five, as I showed you, five cards, one uh, gold each. But if you're lucky, then your first or second hand in Hero Realms could be worth as much as one, two, three, four, six. So you've already got six buying power. So it's just getting the game moving more quickly. You can already tell the difference in the aesthetic, obviously. It's going, it, this is a sort of low budget version of the Game of Thrones amazing artwork it was something i didn't praise enough in the game of thrones video it was the game of thrones artwork spectacular but even though they sell that core set for 40 dollars, but you can easily get it for 20 25 dollars as i mentioned they knew with game of thrones they were going to be releasing expansion pack after expansion pack and face pack and suckers like me but even people with way more money and, and devotion and time to this stuff uh would buy a tons of expansion pack potentially hundreds of dollars i would never do that uh and, and so they knew they'd make their money back until they get the best artist to do the best art you know this you know the valerian steel swords uh uh in uh in game of thrones definitely look better these aren't bad i'll show you some of the cards you know i mean just like let's see if i can fan enough here just like in Star Realms, you have yellow, green, red, and blue. And for the most part, each one corresponds with a faction. Sometimes it corresponds with the same color faction. So, for example... Excuse me. The red faction... Um, and again, I'm, I don't have the names in front of me. The red faction in uh, Hero Realms does what the machine cult red faction does in Star Realms, which is scrap a card, or as they call it, sacrifice a card. So here's Dark Reward, and some of this art is pretty tight. Uh, it's, it, I think it's the rest of the card design I don't love. The actual art's not terrible. So this is a sacrifice card from hand or discard pile with trade, and this is their ally ability. I forget uh, the term in Hero Realms, but we'll just call it ally ability. It's, it's an ally ability. This is just like the trade bot that I showed you two and two with the discard a card. Uh, here's one where um, uh, if you discard, you get it, it, it motivates you even more to, to scrap a card or sacrifice a card because you get uh, two more attack if you do. Now, they what, what are called bases in the other game is what they call champions here. And, you know, they tell you, see that little arrow symbol? Whoops, right here. Uh, that means you need to uh, quote unquote tap it uh, or or kneel it or whatever you want to call it, which is just turn it halfway uh, to or 90 degrees 
uh, like you do when you use the card of magic or Game of Thrones or whatever, but <laughs> essentially they're just, this is just you saying I'm going to use the base, which is something I didn't uh, necessarily say in, uh, in uh, the, uh, in Star Realms, uh, was, you, you know, like I said, occasionally you might not buy something if it's cheap and you don't want any more cheap cards in your deck. There's also some effects on some of the bases that you may not always use or may, but I think the reason they tell you to quote unquote, t um, I think they said expand or exp expend, uh, I'm going to say tap. That's the traditional name tap or kneel is just to actually keep track that you use the base's action. And that would be one of the arguments for Star Realms to put their bases on a normal portrait cards so you don't have some cards like this and some cards like this. I prefer Star Realms. I mean, if you can't keep track of what a base with one damage does, you know, I mean, that's that, that's fine. This is to simulate that it's supposedly more like magic because of the fantasy theme. But again, this says cult priest, human champion, you know, it, this only means that it's essentially a base that they call champions. And why that's important is just having to do with the lingo. So here's a uh, blue uh, card champion, Rake, Master Assassin. Am I getting this here? Um, trying to get... There we go. Yeah, Rake, Master Assassin. Uh, it says, uh, you know, if you if you uh, expend him, if you tap him, then uh, you may stun a target champion. That just means you may destroy a base. When you destroy a base in Star Realms, it's not scrapped. It just goes to their discard pile, which is why buying bases is a very effective strategy. So anyways, it's, you know, it's basically the same mechanics. I'm not going to go through it, you know. I mean, the orcs are almost cartoonish in how similar to, like, Warcraft orcs they look like. Uh, Firebomb, again, you know, more cartoonish, simplistic, less interesting art than Game of Thrones, but that's not really the point. Um, and so even though the colors and the factions and the mechanics are essentially exactly like uh, Star Realms, because the ramp up of money and attack happens quicker, because there's a lot fewer effects, and just everything's simpler, even though the mechanics are the same, you know, even out of the core box, in some ways, especially with the easier to digest fantasy art, it's an easier game to explain, but it's also more relaxing. Like, uh, Star Realms, like, I get really into in terms of the strategy. And so sometimes I wouldn't mind, you know, breaking out what's a stock, but still pleasant to look at fantasy theme, decently well-designed cards, again, very high stock. Uh, and I, I, you know, wouldn't mind, because in some way, it's sort of like, if, if Star Realms is Bridge, then Hero Realms would be Spades, or Jin Rami, or Hearts, or something like that. Has some of the same mechanics of trick-taking and so forth, uh, but requires way less brain power, um, and, and so forth. And so maybe you could teach Star Realms by teaching Hero Realms. I think it's easy to teach Hero Realm. Um, uh, e easier, it's e it is easy to teach Star Realms regardless, but again, if people want to think a little bit less, have their retinas less burned, and just get into the game and have it move more quickly. But really, the main reason, and, and I almost feel like you shouldn't play the game without, even though I only have a couple of them, are, uh, you know, the character packs. They should have had at least a couple included in the base game. Uh, I, you know, just for the hell of it, recently on sale picked up the Wizard. Here's some of the Wizard's cards. You know, doing wizardy things with fireballs and weird cats and so forth. Uh, I love Sexy Cleric. She's such a badass. Look at that mace. Dear God. Of course, they have male and female for both. Uh, for each. And, and a good mix of... Uh, diversity. Here's her doing clerically things. And so I think there's five or six, you know, there's a ranger, there's a, a warrior, there's a thief, you know, all the stock D&D stuff. So it remains stock D&D and stock fantasy, but it, it does add cool things because this, you start with these in your deck. And a lot of these cards are strong enough that you won't necessarily want to scrap them. Maybe you will decide to scrap some of them, but they're strong enough 
Um, and well balanced enough though that that they work at the beginning of the game without ending the game in two seconds because it's like a thousand damage or something. But uh, but they are strong enough that you want to keep them in in your hand, and so it does give you some asymmetric powers, which is always great in any game. I think the brilliance of Star Realms is that you are drawing from you know the same stuff eventually, and that's why their attempts at doing command decks for Star Realms I, I, it's not that they haven't worked; it just doesn't interest me. Whereas with what I would consider overly simplistic Hero Realms, you almost don't want to go uh, whoops without them. They are the ones that improve the counter system for both games, so that's great. Uh, you know, and the other thing is now they have bosses, uh, and honestly, not only are the bosses cooler because it's like a dragon and a lich king, the decks are huge, but they're they're while they can be used the way character packs are used, so I can have dragon fight lich king, uh, which is fun, and you know it, it's 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 a really designed because. The character uh, cards have the cards, you know, that are in the deck on the back, just as a, you know, a reference. But there's many more cards in the deck. They do way more things, and they are meant to play one person against, like, a team of people. It's almost like uh, Fury of Dracula or, like, a dungeon crawl where you've got... The, or D&D, &D, where you've got the game master who's in charge of the boss and all the big bad guys, and then all the scrappy fighters, thieves, and mages, and clerics going after the big boss. That's sort of what it simulates, uh, and so that's kind of fun on its own. Um, or you can even have just one player trying to take down the boss, which is a big challenge because they've got tons of powerful cards. But you also can fight the bosses, and so I would say... If you buy the core Hero Realm set and you, you want just two, you know, character packs, quote unquote, to spice up the game, I would say just go for the boss deck because it's for the same amount of money, you get way more cards, they're a lot cooler and more interesting, and they can be used for a lot more things. So anyways, enough about Star Realms and Hero Realms. Check it out. You can't go wrong with I either way. It's possible I prefer Star Realms just because it came first and so it's more classic and was a sort of, you know, not a revolution, but an evolution, uh, for sure, forward of the, um, uh, the deck building genre. I don't have time, unfortunately, to talk about Ascension, um, maybe on another podcast. I will say, though, that one of the fun things about small card games is that you can get very creative with your storage solutions. Here is a very cool uh, dragon <laughs> uh, chest. I don't know where I got it. Uh, but I remember being very excited about it, and inside I have the entire expanded Ascension card decks. Again, about the same amount of cards as, you know, all of them. They, they all come with about, I want to say, 150 to 200 cards in a starter set. Um, now, oops, now in Ascension, you actually use physical you know, physical tokens. In the Ascension starter set, in the boxes, they come with pretty crappy $1 and $5 um, uh, cardboard coins. I mean, that's like most games. Um, but because in Ascension, you need it for any version or any amount of versions that you have. And just as a form of currency in other games, I bought these very cheaply online. So, you know, you, you don't have to buy all their expensive storage solutions or, you know, rep, you know like... Uh, there's a lot of kind of um, fancy pants game stores uh, uh, or shops that make their own uh, tokens online. You know, if you love, you play a ton of Arkham Horror or, or Game of Thrones, and while if I had tons of money, I would for sure support those shops and get the amazing high quality, you know, metallic uh, replicas uh, of stuff. It's just too expensive. You can find it and be creative on your own. So there's your storage solution. Here's my storage solution for Star Realms. Great game. Thank you so much for joining me. Be back soon. I think I'm going to do uh, Tiny Epic Galaxies and Lords of Waterdeep coming up, but we will have to see. So thank you so much. I've been the Bizzle. You've been awesome. This has been the Bizzle's Board Games, Deconstructing Star Realms. I'll see you next time.